Hello lovely people. This video is sponsored by June's Journey. I hope you're all tucked up, warm and cosy and far too full of Christmas food and even more full of the joys of the season. I hope you all had a wonderful Christmas or if you celebrate it, a delightful Hanukkah. Maybe you're still mid-Kwanzaa or you're hanging on for Omisaka or Epiphany or you're not in the least bit interested in any of those. You just really like the pretty decorations and delicious food. Which is very fair. For me, Christmas was all about seeing the joy in Rupert's little face as he experienced the wonder of just sparkly lights and wrapping paper. He's 18 months old, Christmas as a whole is a bizarre concept for a toddler when you think about it. But you know, scrunching up wrapping paper is fun for everyone. And now we're just about ready to cozy up and forget what day it is for the next week or so. No, seriously, is it Wednesday? Is it Thursday? Who even knows anymore? But in attempting to explain to Rupert why we are doing things that we are doing, I'm a parent attempting to follow Montessori, I explain everything to this child and now he needs to know everything and I have created a rod for my own back. I realised, um, uh, why are we doing the things that we're doing? So I thought it would be a great time to take a look back at all of our Christmas traditions, where they come from and uh, why exactly we do what we do at this time of year. Like. Why do we put all of our presents in a sock anyway? And why is there suddenly a log-shaped Christmas cake in every home? I mean, not that you'll hear me complaining about tradition, but why is it all a bit odd? So pull the box of chocolates closer, get the fairy lights on and settle down as I take you on a magical tour of Christmas traditions. The hand waving is absolutely necessary. Do it with me. It's Christmas hand waving. Now let's talk about today's sponsor, June's Journey. June's Journey is a hidden object mystery game set in the 1920s with a fabulous detective storyline and a diverse cast of characters. Each new scene works as a standalone game, but the real fun is how they all build into the thrilling murder mystery story that uncovers the family secrets of our protagonist, June Parker. Like any plucky, quick-witted, tough cookie, she has a knack for getting into tricky situations and a screw heroine's ability to solve her way out. The game is available for free on mobile devices, phones and tablets, Android and iOS and on the desktop through Amazon and Facebook. With more than 30 million fans all around the world, June's Journey is definitely doing something right and I think that their emphasis on including representative narratives and writing with a varied cast of characters plays a big part in that. Now I use June's Journey as just a kind of nice way to relax thanks to its beautiful graphics and a bit of a light challenge. Anyone else feel like they have to be challenged in order to relax? I mean are you even relaxing if you're not slightly on edge? <laughs> <gasps> it's an issue. Whatever way you like to play, you can click the top link in my description to download June's Journey for free and get started playing. <gasps> oh hi, it's also the pinned comment because I know some of you go to the comments before the video even starts playing, so you know, those of you who've already been there, hi. Hi, hi, hi. What's Christmas all about anyway? Christmas. Christmas. It's a Christian tradition, right? Celebrating the birth of Christ, the lowly manger, the donkey, the three wise men, kind of, but also not so kind of. The history of celebrations at this time of year actually goes much further back. And the Christmas that we celebrate today in the UK, the US and much of Europe has plenty of traditions that are hard to link to the nativity. It all probably started around Neolithic times, more than 5,000 years ago. Gold star if you thought you were going back that far. Back when prehistoric humans were working out how to do human stuff, like farm and live together in towns, they formed primitive religions which are the basis of paganism. For them, the middle of winter was a time of special significance, marking the shortest days of the year and a time when people really could look forward to brighter and warmer days to come. Yeah, 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 sounds about right. I mean, we're just going to Malaysia for all of January, so our brighter days are coming really soon. We know that big feasts and celebrations were held around Midwinter's Day on the 21st of December. Animals were slaughtered so that they didn't have to be fed through the winter, and people gathered to eat pork and beef, drink mead and barley beer, and trade gifts. Yeah, sounds like these pagans already had their priorities straight. Over in Scandinavia, a similar celebration was taking place, starting on the winter solstice and lasting through into January. The Yule Festival, as it's known, involved cutting a huge log and bringing it into the house to burn night and day in honour of the world tree Yggdrasil. Yggdrasil? Yggdrasil? Ah, that is spelled with a Y and two Gs, so I'm absolutely not sorry that I can't pronounce that. 
This was in recognition of the returning of the sun. The Norse people feasted and partied until the log burned out, which could be as many as 12 days. Although I guess varied depending on the log you could bring into your house. Does that mean that some people only had a celebration for one day and then the house next door was like 14 days in, party party, because that would really suck. Also in my house, I think the food would last probably no more than an hour. For small people, my wife and child can really eat like there's no tomorrow, and I have no idea where they put that food. Fast forward to the heady days of the Roman Empire, and a different winter festival called Saturnalia was celebrated. Winters in the Mediterranean weren't so harsh, so Saturnalia was basically a month-long festival to honour the god of agriculture, Saturn. It was a time of excess when normal social order was just turned upside down and the rich celebrated with the poor, servants could order their masters to do things, basically a great way to keep them subjugated for the rest of the year, to be honest. Businesses and schools closed so that everyone could party together wearing bright, fancy colours and, and just really getting their freak on. So far, these ancient festivals sound very fun and uh, very exhausting. And all of this was going on long before Jesus made his appearance, or it became popular to celebrate his birth because, plot twist, the name celebration of Christmas only actually started around the 4th century when Jesus had actually been dead for like 300 years. Because prior to that, Easter was the major event of the Christian calendar to mark that time Jesus died for our sins. Nobody cared about when he'd been born, you know, and even then when the church decided they actually wanted to celebrate his birth, the Bible doesn't um, give a date. God, that must have been really awkward when they then decided to celebrate it. Some scholars at the time suggested he was actually born in the spring, which would explain why there were shepherds out herding. But in the fourth century, Pope Julius I just chose the 25th of December. Many believe that this was in an effort to try and absorb some of the existing midwinter celebrations, especially the popular Roman Saturnalia. So, the Christmas celebrations continued to evolve with a new Christian flavour through medieval and Tudor times, but the theme of revelry and major excess continued, and Christmas was celebrated in a raucous, carnival-like atmosphere. The central figure of these festivities wasn't Father Christmas or Santa, but a regular person who was crowned the Lord of Misrule, whose responsibility it was to coordinate the revelry. They'd organise raids into the local towns to go to the houses of the rich and demand their best food or drink, and, um, terrorise them if they didn't comply. Suddenly that somewhat demanding line of now bring us your figgy pudding seems to make a lot more sense. Things started to change around the 17th century when Christianity took a more serious turn. No boo. Under Oliver Cromwell, the Puritan movement hated all kinds of decadence and actually pushed to ban Christmas altogether. But when Charles II came to the throne, he thankfully brought all that back. Woohoo! Not everyone was pleased, um, and those that weren't, scarpered. So the pilgrims that went to America in 1620 were even more extreme in their Puritan views, and celebrating Christmas was banned in Boston for more than 30 years. Even after the American Revolution, Christmas didn't really become a thing in the US until the late 19th century. I mean, meanwhile, back in England, the Christmas we know today really began to take shape during the Victorian times. Instead of lavish community feasts and parties, Queen Victoria and her family helped to guide us into a much quieter, family-focused celebration. A side note, many people credit Victoria's husband, Prince Albert, with bringing the Christmas tree to England, but it was actually her grandmother, Queen Charlotte, who set up the first one at the palace in 1800, although they were both from Germany. The Victorian era did usher in the eating of goose and turkey, as well as printed Christmas cards being exchanged. Boxing Day was also first celebrated at this time on the day after Christmas, when tips were left for servants and tradesmen in a special Christmas box. The final touches in our modern Christmas have evolved over the last hundred years or so, with the inevitable commercialisation of many of the original Christmas ideas. Publishers, marketers and private companies have helped to shape big parts of our modern Christmas, from glass baubles to Christmas cards, fairy lights to advent calendars. You know, if you think commercialisation was bad right now, and uh, my gosh it really is, kind of no different to how it's been for a century. With such a checkered history, the ways we've celebrated Christmas have transformed repeatedly over the millennia. There are lots of things that we do today that seem pretty odd when you step back and look at them with non-Christmassy eyes. And there are some even stranger things that people used to do in the past. Many of them sound, um, frankly pretty unpleasant, while others could be due for a comeback. I'll let you make up your own minds which is which. You know that phrase, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Well, it turns out probably none of the things we do in his name. Well, get ready for a round of WDWDT. Why did we do that? That's definitely going to catch on. WDWTT, oh gosh. Yeah, I'm just gonna keep tripping over that. 
Advent. There are some people who like to start Christmas pretty much straight after Halloween, but for most, the countdown to the big day really starts on the 1st of December, when that first door of the Advent calendar is cracked open. We've long abandoned any idea of Advent calendars being just for children. There are Advent calendars containing everything from gin to jewellery, chocolate to cosmetics, but what has any of this really got to do with Christmas? Now, Advent itself is a Christian concept. It literally means coming in Latin. It marks the four-week preparation for celebrations of Christ's birth. But technically, Advent begins on the Sunday nearest the 30th of November. So this year, in 2022, Advent actually began the 27th of November. Shock horror. You missed the three extra days of your Advent calendar this year. <gasps> Treat yourself to that extra chocolate. But before we do get too excited, also remember that next year, 2023, Advent begins on the 3rd of December, so we get two fewer days. Yeah, I can now see why calendar makers just uh, picked the 1st of December and, and made it easier for everyone. The Christian Advent countdown has its origins in Germany in the 19th century. In churches, it was common to burn a candle each Sunday during Advent, and this translated into burning a candle at home a little bit each day as Advent passes. Sometimes the Germans would also mark their doors or walls with chalk for each day of Advent, and this then involved into the idea of hanging up a religious picture each day. So this led to the first purpose-made wooden calendar in 1851, but it had no doors and, you know, no creaking excitement for each day of the countdown which then came 50 years later, when the German publisher Gerhard Lang came up with a printed design from a verse from the Bible and a religious picture that children could cut out and stick. These then morphed into little cardboard doors around 1920. Chocolate appeared behind the doors as a little treat and eventually the Bible verses and religious imagery disappeared and now it's just a lot of chocolate. I mean, not really, because we can buy calendars to suit every taste, you know, gin, but yeah, they're pretty far away from the religious beginning. Why did we do that? Decorations. Now, one of the things guaranteed to get you in the Christian spirit is decorating the house. And today's decorations offer something for everyone. A Christmas tree in every room. <gasps> Garlands and baubles everywhere. <gasps> a gigantic inflatable Santa on your front lawn. <gasps> mm. You do you, honey. You do you. And decorations are as old as the oldest Christmas celebrations themselves. Because the festivities have their origins in midwinter festivals, the emphasis has always been on evergreen foliage, which symbolises eternal life. Holly, ivy, fir and spruce all keep their leaves through the coldest times of the year, so bedecking a party or decorating a house with their branches is a reminder of the warmer times to come. But when Christians co-opted the December festivities, they didn't like the idea of holly and ivy, which have a lot of pagan significance, so... They were actually banned from churches, but people still brought them into their homes for good luck. So eventually the plants were kind of just sanctified because, you know, got to go with it. Holly was taken to represent the thorned crown which Jesus wore and the red berries as the beads of blood. Just what you want to be thinking about when you're starting to feel festive. Now, if you've hung up a sprig of mistletoe above your door, hoping for a kiss, then you're also participating in an ancient but evolved tradition. Mistletoe used to be so sacred that it could only be cut by druids with a golden sickle. I mean, now it's okay for us mere mortals to handle it, but it still carries some of that sacred significance. It signifies peace, and people who met underneath it were forbidden from fighting. Reminder to your entire household. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell your parents. Decorating your home with it meant that you were willing to offer protection to anyone who entered. Then, in Victorian times, a new tradition emerged that allowed a gentleman to pluck a berry and kiss a lady from the cheek. On the cheek. Just the cheek. When there are no more berries, no more kisses can be given, so stop. If your mistletoe sprig has no more berries, sad to say you're out of luck. One Christmas decoration that seems to have fallen by the wayside is the kissing bar, which was hung over doorways to welcome guests. They were made from crossed hoops covered in greenery and adorned with mistletoe and ribbons that could measure up to a metre and a half across, which is quite a lot. Perhaps the reason we don't see them so much is because the hallways of the average home now would struggle to accommodate such a big floating green orb. And yet we do always seem to find space for an entire tree in at least one room. When you think about it, cutting down a tree and bringing it inside for a few weeks is more than a little bit strange. And that's before you get to the lights and the gaudy ornaments. Christmas trees were originally bare branches decorated with nuts and fruits after the leaves had fallen to symbolize the promise of spring to come. This evolved into evergreen trees being brought inside and more ornate decorations made out of whatever families had available to them. You'd have things like 
fruit, apples, springs of popcorn and cranberries, paper streamers and metal foil. I, originally the trees were lit by candles amongst their branches, which is frankly just a terrifying fire hazard. But after Thomas Edison popularised the light bulb, his friend and colleague came up with the idea of stringing them together and wrapping them around a Christmas tree in 1882. So the modern decorated Christmas tree was born! And of course, ornaments have evolved into modern times. These days, the mass-produced baubles are probably an homage to the original fruits and nuts hung on the tree. Apparently, in the US, there's even a tradition of a Christmas pickle, where children are encouraged to search for a pickle in return for a small gift, even if that gift is only a pickle. Huh? WD, WDT, why do we do that? Food and drink. These days our Christmas tables are full of things like turkey, nut roasts, roast vegetables and sweet treats like mince pies and Christmas pudding, but they've definitely not always looked like that. For the longest time the food of choice for Christmas celebrations was meat, meat and more meat, with scarcely a vegetable in sight. Perhaps this stemmed from the ancient custom of slaughtering herds during Neolithic times. Or maybe it was just an excuse to eat some of the most calorie-dense food people could get their hands on in order to get ready for the lean times of winter. But right up until Tudor times, the focus was on protein and not much else. In fact, the Tudors made a point of serving up pretty much anything that walked or squawked. Along with the traditional boar's head, standard, you could find badger, blackbird and swan on the feasting table. I mean. They even roasted peacocks whole and presented them with their feathers reattached. I love peacocks. And in some places, homes would serve up stargazy pie with a whole fish poking out of the top of the pie crust, eyes turned to the stars. Hmm, appetizing. In some places, food that would be normally plain and dull would be livened up with herbs and spices. And this gave rise to some of the dishes we're familiar with today. Now, a mince pie wasn't the dainty sweet treat it is today. It was a monstrous pie, shaped to look like the crib of baby Jesus and filled to bursting with 13 ingredients that were meant to represent Christ and his apostles. Those ingredients included the expected prunes, dates and raisins, alongside the less expected beef fat and various meats. So yes, sorry, mince meat is as gross as it sounds. Similarly, the Christmas pudding first made its appearance as a dish called frumenty, but this was actually more like soup than a pudding. It was made from a mixture of mutton and beef, mixed with raisins, currants and spices and wine. Mm -hmm. I for one am very glad there's less meat and more sweet in our Christmas fare these days. The Victorians did help to rein in the ridiculous Christmas eating, with first goose and then turkey being favoured as the main meat of the meal. Just that. And they even, shock horror, made a place for vegetables on the table. Although even then things were a little off kilter, with the asparagus and tomatoes taking pride of place, which, okay. As for drinks, well in the past pretty much anything warm and spiced has been fair game, although for some reason eggs seem to feature heavily as well. I can honestly say I have never had a drink and wished it had more egg in it. But at Christmas time, who's to hold you back? Someone should hold you back. Also not quite a drink, but involving one, is a frankly terrifying rest of games from Victorian times called Snapdragon. Ha, uh, do you remember your parents talking about this? Raisins were put into a shallow dish, doused with brandy, and then ignited. And then children, yes children, plunged their hands into the flames to try and grab a raisin. Those who managed it got, would you believe it, a raisin. And probably some lovely festive burns as well. Hmm. Nice. What a weird world we live in. WD, WDT. Why do we do that? Gifts. I've never been one to ask why someone is giving me something, but the Christmas tradition of gift giving seems universal these days. And incredibly, despite the many changing faces of Christmas, it's been a pretty common thread through all its different incarnations. The giving and receiving of gifts is just one of those lovely human things we do to show one another we care about each other. And what better time to do it than during the annual feasting days? Also, it's kind of cold and dark and we're sad. The Neolithic people would have given gifts of precious metal jewellery and bronze tools. Druids handed out mistletoe branches for good fortune, and during the Roman Saturnalia festival, people exchanged gifts of small wax or pottery figurines called cigaria. Ugh. With the change to Christianity, the gifts given at Christmas came to represent those gifts given to Jesus by the wise men. Often low-value gifts were more highly valued as a measure of the regard you have for the giftee. If your gift was too lavish, 
was a sign you were trying too hard, which I think is actually pretty great and we could all live by that as a particular tradition these days. Interestingly though, the tradition of giving gifts to children didn't happen around Christmas, but rather on St Nicholas Day, as St Nicholas was the patron saint of children, and then adults exchanged their presents at New Year's Eve. But all got blended into one with the Protestant Reformation that tried to reduce the number of feast days. God, ruining everyone's fun. By the 19th century, the two had merged at the conveniently placed middle date of Christmas, although people around Europe still exchange their gifts on different days throughout the festive season. WD, WDT, why do we do that? Superstitions. As with any tradition that has continued for millennia, Christmas has developed its own particular brand of law and superstition. If you don't do things quite as they should be done, you can expect terrible, horrible, bad luck or misery in the year to come. <laughs> So let's round off this video with a quick pop quiz of how many times you've brought bad luck onto yourself this Christmas. Let me know in the comments how many of these you've broken. Let's start before Christmas itself, shall we? Yay. You should start baking your Christmas pudding, yes, baking it, not buying it, on Stir Up Sunday, which is the last Sunday before Advent. When making it, you should stir it from east to west, so signify the direction the wise men travelled to reach the baby Jesus. Mm. Even if you're tempted, you mustn't cut into it before Christmas Eve. And of course, you should save a piece for New Year's Day. Did you save a piece? The Yule Log shouldn't be the chocolate variety, but the giant Scandinavian wooden variety. And the fire that contains it must not go out for the duration of celebration or you have to stop celebrating. Oh, but you can't stir the fire or disturb it in any way. Mm -mm. Only people with clean hands should handle a Yule Log and anyone who is cross-eyed or flat-footed shouldn't be allowed in the same room as the fire. Sorry, Uncle Edgar, you're out. When decorating your home with evergreen foliage, if you're bringing in holly, then it must be accompanied by ivy. But you shouldn't decorate your house before Christmas Eve, and mistletoe shouldn't be brought into the house before New Year's Eve. <gasps> Meanwhile, you shouldn't ever leave your Christmas tree undecorated. And of course, you mustn't leave your decorations up past 12 night, or there will be certain doom. I mean, that might be difficult to judge, because many people still have a hard time deciding whether 12th night falls on the 5th or the 6th of January. Carols shouldn't be sung before the advent or after Twelfth Night 2, which is a very sensible rule. Less sensible, though, is the suggestion that you should sweep your house on Christmas Day to sweep the bad luck away, because, um, no, that is a day I hope to get away without doing any cleaning. And finally, and perhaps most bizarrely, you shouldn't give shoes as a gift for someone you love on Christmas Day in case they put them on and walk straight out of your life. Well, I think I broke nine rules there, so <laughs> I'm doomed. There you have it. More Christmas facts and tidbits than you can lazily shake a candy cane at. I, for one, am very grateful for the low-key celebrations we get to enjoy today, even if nobody has gifted me a bronze dagger yet. Bit sad, actually. No bronze dagger. Let me know which of these bygone Christmas traditions you'd like to see returned, and I will see you next time, when hopefully, um, I'll have figured out what day it is. It will also be my annual uh, goals and wishes video, which is very fun because we get to look back at the last year and then look forwards at the year to come and I get to tell you about what wonderful things are going to come up in the year ahead. Oh, that is exciting. I almost forgot about that. I like doing that video. That is fun. Thank you very much to June's Journey for sponsoring this video. Remember to click the top link in the description to download the game, start playing and indulge in your own beautiful vintage relaxation. I'll see you in my next video. Bye-bye.